Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Rojas. I'm the Chief Special Services Officer at HRA. I'm also the Acting First Deputy Commissioner at HRA, and it's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much this afternoon because I have experts, amazing folks who I get to work with almost on a daily basis. Um, but today here, we're here to talk about supportive housing, what's new, and really we're going to talk about um, the benefits of supportive housing, the challenges, and a lot of things that are on the horizon. So I'm going to kick it off um, with uh, a little bit of run a show, what we're going to do. I'm going to do a bit of an intro, just introduce our, our distinguished panel. Um, and then we're going to have a presentation from each of them, a short presentation. But the bulk of the, of the panel is really going to be questions. Um, we're going to have about 40 to 45 minutes where all of y'all are going to ask us questions, and, and hopefully we can answer them, because this is the brain trust. And, um, and even before I start um, introducing them, these four individuals um, really represent the oversight and the administration and the management of almost all of supportive housing in New York City. These, four agent, these three agencies, along with state units, of course, our state colleagues, but really these three agencies really um, manage most of the supportive housing in New York City. So um, really, if you have any questions, please, we're going to encourage you. We're going to, this is an interactive panel. We want to hear from you. We want to get your feedback, your insight, and also mostly your questions so we could really have a, a good, lively conversation. So I'm going to get started. Um, I'm going to give a little um, background on our colleagues. Even though I printed um, my document in 25 font, I still need my reading glasses. So, <laughs> so bear with me. I'm a man of a certain age. Um, so I'm going to start with um, introducing Jamie Nichols. Uh, Jamie is the Assistant Commissioner at the Bureau of Mental Health um, in the Division of Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And Jamie has, um, leads the Mental Health Bureau um, where she's worked at for the last 15 years. Jamie is committed to collaborating with consumers, providers, advocates, and governmental partners to identify and implement programmatic, bureaucratic, and political solutions to improve mental health and wellness for the people of the city of New York. So thank you, Jamie, for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Next, um, we have Emily Lehman. She's the Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Special Needs Housing at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. At HPD, Emily oversees several programs, including the Supportive Housing Loan Program. Since stepping into this role, Emily has financed more than 12,000 units of affordable, supportive, and senior housing. So welcome, Whoa. Emily. <laughs> Next, we have um, uh, Jacqueline Dudley. She's the Deputy Commissioner of the HIV AIDS Services Administration at the Human Resources Administration at the Department of Social Services. Let's say that three times. <laughs> so, um, so for all of y'all who may not know, um, HRA, the Human Resources Administration, and the Department of Homeless Services all live within the Department of Social Services. So that's sometimes a little complicated. Um, but uh, Ms. Dudley has been a staff member at HRA for over 25 years. She started her career at HRA in the Office of Legal Affairs as an attorney, where she served over 13 years, rising to the level of Associate General Counsel. She was appointed Deputy Commissioner of HASA in 2010, and she continues in that role. And last, but definitely not least, we have Craig Retchless. Um, he's the Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Supportive and Affordable Housing and Services at, the, at HRA DSS. And Craig is a licensed certified social worker with 25 years experience as a provider and in government developing, implementing, and operating social services in New York City, mostly in supportive housing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get started. I'm going to turn it over to Craig. He's going to start the presentations. We're going to ask if you could hold your questions till after um, the presentation, and then we're going to open up for questions on the, um, on the presentation as well as any other questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Craig. Okay, great. How is everyone doing? Good. All right. We're going to stay awake, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. All right, all right. Oh, let's do next. Me try do you want? Maybe that works better. Can you escape? Press escape. No. Yeah. Ah, I think you could use the arrows. Oh, the arrows. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, thank you, John. 
Rojas, uh, our uh, amazing moderator here. And uh, I just want to start out to say I'm very honored to be on a panel with such distinguished people in the supportive housing field. Um, yeah, so this is our panel discussion. And so under HRA, um, you will have me going through the awards and the contracts piece of the 1515 process. And um, uh, we're also going to be touching on eligibility and CAPS. Um, I know there are people who are fans of CAPS, and then there are people who are not so much a fan of CAPS. Uh, but it is the system that we built to meet the federal requirement for coordinated entry, and we're always open to feedback on how to improve that system. So just putting that out there. And then, um, and then also under HRA, we're going to have uh, Jackie uh, help us out with, uh, uh, she'll provide information on the housing portfolio. So thank you, Jackie. And then, um, uh, then HPD, um, Accelerating 1515 Production. Emily, how are we going to accelerate 1515 production? We'll have to wait Don't answer. <laughs> Let's keep them all in suspense, okay? All right. And then uh, uh, Jamie uh, Knuckles will be bringing it on home with some really interesting stats on tenant demos and an analysis of key performance indicators. So um, thank you so much, and uh, like uh, John said, we'll be doing a kind of a robust Q&A at the end here. All right. So um, probably a lot of people know the different roles, but we do want to set the table for like what each agency does around the 1515 development process. And so HRA does uh, the coordination around the procurement. We do eligibility for 1515. And um, the Office of Support of Affordable Housing does uh, the referrals and placements for 1515. So um, I'm very proud of our department to be you know, not only doing the eligibility, but also helping to move the, um, the uh, individuals and families from shelter into the 1515 unit. So um, that's a, that, that is the, um, the HRA role. Uh, New York City Health, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, they are doing technical assistance, contract monitoring, and evaluation, and they do much more than that. But that's what we have on our bullets. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development does the financing and rental assistance piece. Uh, so that is uh, setting the table for the New York City 1515 initiative. So how are we doing so far? Uh, at this point, the city has awarded over 7,200 units to housing providers. And we're going to get into this a little bit down uh, in, later in the presentation, it's not evenly divided congregate and scattered site. So the original vision was 7,500 units of congregate, 7,500 units of scattered site. But there are, uh, you know, there are. Uh, we're going to be addressing that. Um, really, there is an uneven interest in uh, congregate and scattered site, and so really heavily towards the the congregate. Um, and then um, I, we do want to, you know, give a shout out to the admis administration has committed to accelerating this. We are in a crisis, a homeless crisis. So that is why we're here to, you know, um, you know, move people from the shelters into uh, supportive housing, those who are in need of it. Um, so we're going to be accelerating that by two years, and Emily but we'll be getting into that later. Okay. So what is the breakdown? And I, I love this slide. Emily did this slide. Um, sorry, I was geeking out on it earlier. <laughs> um, and so uh, you can see there, it also is a, a good illustration of the roles of each agency. So you have um, HRA. Um, we're doing the awards, right? We're doing the procurement process. Um, and uh, right now we're at... Uh, 6,000, a little over 6,000 congregate and um, 
uh, over 1,200 scattered site for a total of 7,300 units. Um, units financed by HPD is over six, uh, approximately 3,600 units. And then units contracted by DOHMH, those are um, you know, now um, you know, active in the community, serving people, um, almost 3,000 units. And they're doing their, doing their monitoring of those programs in terms of levels of services and things like that. And then, um, and then we have placements. And so placement really is like all, we all have a role in that. Placements is the total number of people who have actually been served in New York City 1515 um, since its inception. And so there's turnover. So it's over 3,000 people who have been served in the, in the um, initiative. All right, this is something that I was alluding to earlier. So um, these are, I'm not going to go through, this is a rather dense slide. So I'm not going to go into all of the numbers here. But we have, a, we have a green circle, and we have a, like an orange circle. The green circle is the amount of congregate units that have been awarded to housing providers. So we're already at 80% of the congregate. And um, so that it, that's, that's a little bit good news, but also, like, you know, we're, we're taking a look at that, you know, because... What, it, what it's saying to us, government, is that um, there is, as I said before, there's an uneven interest in, to pursue scattered site, which is now only at 17% of the 7,500 units that we had planned for that. And I think everyone here knows that there are good reasons for that, and um, maybe we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, but we are going to be, you know, government is looking at this, is reviewing this, and um, so stay tuned. This is a slide, contracted units to date. So this is just another breakdown of the different populations. Um, you know, there's single adults, there's adult families, families with children, young adults, singles and young adult families. And I do want to call out young adult families because that's a brand new population. And I think that that's amazing. It's a very well-funded program to you know, uh, support our young adult families in our community. But you can see the breakdown of the total contracted units. Eligibility. So um, this is a breakdown of all those who have been approved for 1515 since inception, and then it gives uh, some metrics on the total number who are actively on a list for referral, which we call clients awaiting placement in CAPS. Um, and so you can see there, there is, um, right now we have, I'm going to make a plug here, we have a, a very, we have a shortage of family applications. So if there are family shelter providers in in the room, I would like to make a, a you know a plea to you that um, we do need more. And um, what we're finding is that um, you know there are a lot of um, misconceptions about supportive housing in the shelter system sometimes about like what people think supportive housing is. And so um, I would appeal to you to, you know, kind of talk to people about supportive housing, the advantages, especially for families with children, because a lot of these programs, and if you run a families with children program, know how supportive it is of families and the children. And, and um, so I'm making that kind of appeal here. Um, but as you can see, um, we have, a, we have a need for that in terms of the, um, the populations approved. This is another kind of breakdown of the placement process. And so um, I'm not going to go through those numbers, but the slide can be available. And, um, you know, the, as you can see, we are, we are keeping pace with, uh, you know, placing 
um, for all populations and um, so forth. So um, this is the, um, okay, this is the last slide. Yes, okay. So coordinated referral and placement. Um, so uh, this is kind of a list of things that we've been doing recently around coordinated referral and placement. Uh, um, as of October, well, we started the effort in April of 2022, where, um, where a supportive housing provider can uh, make a request of a HRA for a referral for a vacant unit. This is not for all the units, but it's for the ones that OSAS um, is in oversight of. And then um, that process is now electronic in the CAP system. So if you go to the CAP system and you look it up, you can, it actually tells you, um, you know, where you're going to be getting your referral from. And you can make a referral uh, electronically in the system. Um, and that is going very well. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback for that. We've also eliminated the manifest. I'm not sure if everyone here knows what the manifest is. Um, and, um, and we've also gotten a lot of good feedback on making that process electronic. Um, so um, I'll be speaking more to that later. But we implemented that in March 2023. And so now housing providers and shelter providers um, no longer have the need to, you know, track in a manual way the status of people being referred to them. And then um, I do want to give a shout out to our state partners. Um, uh, SOMH contracted with CUCS, and they have been uh, doing a redesign of the SPOA process, and they're now using the CAP system to uh, affect referral and placement for the SOMH contracted units, which I think is really exciting. Um, as, a, as a former provider, um, I always felt like that was a system in need of redesign, and so uh, this is good news. And so they do use the CAP system for that. And then, um, and then just a, a, a little brag here that um, since we've implemented a lot of uh, monitoring tools in CAPs, and uh, done a lot of training and outreach with providers. Um, we've seen a, an increase in occupancy rates overall in the supportive housing system, going from just under 90% in May of 2022 to almost 94% now. So I think that that's a, a significant um, improvement in the system. So anyway, I will now hand it off to my colleague, Jackie Dudley. Thank you. Thank you. He's much more tech savvy than I am. Like before you leave, show me how to advance the screen. Because... John had to teach me. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to see you guys. Um, so many faces I know. Some are new. And my name is. I'm Jacqueline Dudley, as you know, and I'm Deputy Commissioner of the HASA program. Um, John Rojas is my boss, so y'all pretend like I'm doing a good job, even if I'm not. <laughs> even if I'm not, just tell me later on the side if I, if I suck. Don't tell me if I'm right now, because <laughs> that's, that's my boss. <laughs> and um, I'm here to just add on a little bit to what uh, uh, Craig has been talking about, because HASA is the one... Um, program within um, HRA that actually does contract mm -hmm. for supportive housing. So we're coming at this from a little bit of a different angle um, th than um, Craig and his team. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just briefly talk about, and I, like, like my boss, I can't see either. I need my glasses. <laughs> um, HASA, the HIV AIDS Services Administration, provides critical benefits and services to one of New York City's most vulnerable populations, that being low-income New Yorkers diagnosed with HIV or AIDS. Among the services provided are case management and access to emergency housing, as well as permanent supportive housing. As of April 2023, HASA served 32,000 
790 clients, and that includes um, 2,632 families. Um, we have a, a very robust supportive housing portfolio. We have um, 2,860 units of congregate um, supportive housing. We also have 2,672 units of scatter site supportive housing for a total of 5,532 units. We also, HASA program is also tasked with providing um, emergency housing for clients on the same day for clients who present as homeless to us. And so as part of our job in um, providing the housing for those clients, we have a um, transitional supportive housing portfolio and we have um, currently have 782 units of transitional supportive housing. So what is new with HASA? Um, with HASA supportive housing, um, in fiscal year 2023, HASA released an RFP and awarded 400 units of New York, New York 3 scatter site housing and 2,272 units of non-New York, New York 3 scatter site housing. This represents the entire um, HASA scatter site portfolio. Um, coming up later on this year, in fiscal year 2024, our plan is to release an open-ended RFP for 3,000 units of transitional congr congregate housing. That's emergency housing, and that will include approximately 2,100 new units of um, emergency housing we'll be issuing RFP for. And um, many of our providers have been coming to us um, and, and raising the issue of difficulty in uh, um, attracting and retaining um, um, uh, personnel and staff. And we're having, of course, some of the same issues with this in the city. And so in order to make sure that, and to assist our providers in being able to recruit and retain staff, um, we've worked with them and worked with you all to, um, on some of the requirements for eligibility, particularly in the case management capacity. And to that end, um, we have no longer required that um, case managers have an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree. Instead, we're asking that candidates for case managers for supportive housing programs have a high school diploma or equivalent and at least um, four years of experience in social services and providing um, um, assistance to, to vulnerable clients such as ours. And we're hoping that that will assist our, our providers in being able to recruit and retain staff and um, in this difficult hiring market that we're all in right now. Um, and lastly, for those of you who don't already have it, that's just a link. And uh, I believe this slide will be sent around later, but that's just a link to our um, HASA external website for more information about the HASA program. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> that cold chicken is kind of hitting me now. So <laughs> 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 Still sleepy, but oops. Um, okay. But it was delicious. It was delicious. <laughs> it was it delicious. really good. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm glad that I'm standing. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what HPD is up to. Um, so just a little bit about what HPD has been doing around supportive housing. Um, so big picture, um, since 2014, um, HPD has financed approximately 10,000 units of supportive housing. Um, we're really proud of hitting that milestone. Um, those 10,000 units make up a mix of NYC 1515, New York, New York 3, uh, state and federal resources such as ESHI or VASH, um, and then we're, we've also uh, been preserving a lot of existing supportive housing as well. Um, of those 10,000 units, about 7,000 have completed construction. Um, and since the launch of the 1515 initiative, um, we've financed approximately 3,600 units. That number is from March of this year. Um, for those of you that are in development, you know that we're in the last week of June. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very busy week for HPD, and so we're hoping um, by sometime in early July we'll be able to report that that number has increased by a few hundred units. So thank you to everyone in the room that is helping us get there. 
Um, and of the 1515 units that we financed, about half have completed construction. So we're making progress um, on 1515 and supportive housing production in general. Um, as folks may know, um, the Adams administration launched Housing Our Neighbors, a blueprint for housing and homelessness. This is this administration's housing plan. Um, one, of the, one of the key goals in this plan was related to supportive housing and committed us to accelerating our 1515 initiative by two years. Um, so we are now focused on um, completing the 15,000 units by the end of 2028. For HPD, that means our goal is to have financed our share of, our share of the 1515 initiative, so all the congregate units will have at least started construction by then. Um, so that's what we've been working on. We've been working with our partners uh, at our sister agencies to get there. Um, and so I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that. Um, it is a very ambitious goal, um, particularly at a moment um, where you know, federal resources are what they are, um, projects are more expensive, um, and so resources are not going as far. But we are trying to think creatively about ways to keep the pipeline grow growing um, and prioritizing supportive housing. Um, so just a few ways that we're doing this. Um, so first, we are, uh, almost all of our loan programs have a homeless set-aside requirement in them. Um, and so developers can opt to make any of those set-aside units supportive housing. So that means if you're doing a new construction project, you can have supportive housing through the supportive housing loan program. But you can also have a supportive component in an ELLA project or a SARA project or an NCP. Um, really, any any project. Um, you just need to, if you if you are not a supportive housing provider, you would need to partner with a provider. They would need to apply for the the service funding. But we encourage folks to bring fifteen fifteen, especially into their projects. Um, we are looking for ways to finance supportive housing um, without the need for LIHTC and volume cap, which are limited by the federal government. Um, I also want to put in a plug for folks, if you are in the advocacy, advocacy space, to continue to help us advocate at the federal <coughs> level for fixes, things like the 50% the test, which is related to volume cap, and uh, changes to LIHTC that will just give us more federal tools. Um, but uh, while we're waiting for that to happen, we are looking uh, for opportunities to finance deals without LIHTC. <laughs> or volume cap um, that does require more capital subsidy um, from the city, so also helping us advocate for more capital in our budget. Um, and other, other unique tools, we're also putting out a call for folks, if you have creative ideas for ways we can use our financing sources more smartly to increase, um, to keep the pipeline moving and growing. We would love to hear from you. Um, and then we're also prioritizing preservation of supportive housing. And I know there are other panels today that are focused on preservation, um, but we really do um, identify this as a, a key need within the, the portfolio. Um, and although we don't have a specific preservation loan program that's dedicated just to supportive housing, we have a lot of tools in our, our preservation tool chest that we can deploy. Um, and we're working with our partner agencies to look at ways to grow those tools. Um, to make it easier to preserve existing housing. Um, land, so we need land to build more housing. Um, folks are great at finding private sites, and so we are continuing to take new proposals and support, um, support uh, folks purchasing sites uh, with assistance from the New York Acquisition Fund. So please continue to bring us your sites. Um, and then we also are making public sites available for supportive housing. So we have uh, HPD will put out RFPs for land from time to time. We encourage folks to take a look at that. You can put together a proposal on your own. You can put together a proposal with a developer um, or maybe you're um, a joint venture in the ownership structure or perhaps you are just the service provider. Um, there's lots of different ways that supportive housing um, can be structured and included in public sites. Um, and so we encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Um, I want to give a particular shout out to Health and Hospitals. Um, they've been a great partner with us, um, providing land to develop supportive housing. Um, and that really dovetails nicely with their Housing for Health initiative that they launched under this administration. Um, and then the third way we're making public sites available is through the supportive housing request for qualifications, 
Um, so we recently release, re-released this RFQ um, after 10 years. Um, the deadline was earlier this month, but it is a rolling application. So if there are any nonprofit supportive housing developers in the room that have not applied for it yet, um, you can still apply. We are looking to create a list of pre-qualified nonprofit supportive housing developers to whom we can de- uh, designate city public sites to in the future. So it's great to, to get your name on the list um, for future opportunities. Um, this is just a little bit more about the RFQ itself um, and the, the email address. The RFQ itself can be downloaded on our website. And if you have any questions, um, supportive housing RFQ at hpd.nyc.gov is the email address. Um, so that's just a, a quick snapshot of what HPD is doing. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jamie. Emily, you may be the youngest among us because you're the only one <laughs> without reading glasses. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Nichols. That's true. From the health department. Um, so it gets financed, it gets built, contracts are registered, tenants move in, and then what? I'm going to give you a high level view about uh, the people residing in DOHMH contracted supportive housing who have left periods of homelessness and are now still, at the time of move-in, move in experiencing mental illness or substance use disorders. So um, my, my um, information will go beyond uh, 1515 units um, to talk about um, the, the larger universe of, of DOHMH contracted um, supportive housing tenants with some demographic information. Um, uh, as well as um, some a- analysis of key performance indicators, um, looking at that by site type, congregate scattered, as well as by um, race and ethnicity. Um, so our data comes from uh, contracted providers. Perhaps some of you have entered data into our system, so thank you. Um, and thank you to my staff who, who pulled those uh, slides together. Um, the data were pulled a couple weeks ago, reflecting resident information as of the end of, of calendar year 2022. Um, we have over 11,000 units of uh, supportive housing in contract with us. This data represents around 9,000 of those units, uh, so it's not perfect. It's not complete. Um, and this is not a final published report, um, but I think it will give you a really good sense of who's in our housing and how they're doing. Um, uh, we're going to look to see if there's any trends or disparities by site types as well. So I, I hope you find the information um, interesting and, and it stimulates some questions and discussion. So you can see the split, about three quarters of our uh, units are congregate, about one quarter are scattered. Um, The bar chart on the uh, the lower left of your screen looks at uh, the age of the the head of household, the leaseholder, the, the, um, the client, right, the person essentially who qualified for the unit. We know there are more people in, in, in these units um, sometimes, but we're talking about really the, the, the head of household. And so you can see that the age um, uh, skews a little bit older. Uh, more than half of our residents are, are 55 plus, um, and we anticipate that number will grow, right? Um, uh, because people will live longer um, in safe, stable, dignified housing. So that's a good thing. Um, the pie chart shows us that the vast majority of our tenants are single adults. Um, 9% are living with children, and the rest are a mix of people living with partners or other relatives or unrelated adults. So we have a lot of uh, complicated uh, measurements at the health department. We're really famous for that. Um, But this one is really simple. (laughs) Um, Perhaps the most important thing, I think, about supportive housing is that it ends a period of homelessness, right? So we can see here that, on average, people stay in our housing for five, six, seven years. Um, And as we build more units, as as you all build more units, um, we anticipate that um, length of stay will go up. we don't really have a target length of stay, right? That's not exactly how it works because people move into supportive housing at different points in their life. Did I screw this up? There we go. Um, uh, and sometimes people move out for very positive reasons, um, but we do keep an eye on this measure um, simply, again, because the act of housing somebody who was previously unhoused is, I think, arguably the you know, most powerful public health intervention that we have at the health department. 
Um, of course, we aim to do more than simply house people. Um, we know that uh, your programs, the programs many of you operate, co collaborate with residents to cultivate you know, supportive communities in the buildings, um, to integrate with the neighborhoods um, around you, um, all to promote sort of well-being, emotional, and physical health. Um, we think remaining housed is, is a platform for this, um, and so we do really closely look at length of stay. Um, oh, and I'll go back. I just point out there is a, a little bit of a longer length of staying congregate uh, than scattered units. Um, does that mean that you know congregates are more successful keeping people than scattered? No, it doesn't. Um, it might mean something, but there's some differences about the units. I think more congregate units are older than scatter sites tend to be a little bit newer. Um, uh, but but we do um, uh, look and are trying to learn from some of the differences between these site types. So here's some information about race and ethnicity by site type. Um, we don't see large differences uh, between congregate and scattered. Um, but compared to the, the larger New York City adult population, residents in both kinds of our housing are disproportionately black and non-Hispanic. In general, uh, the general population of New York City, 22% of adults identify as black, non-Hispanic, while the shelter population, which is the primary referral source for our units, and, and so perhaps a, a more appropriate sort of comparison group is uh, we, we see that 56% of adults um, and children in shelter identify as black, non-Hispanic. Um, so the data suggests that um, we are proportionally, um, uh, uh, that, or that people in shelter are proportionally accessing our supportive housing. Black, non-Hispanic people in shelter are proportionally accessing our, our supportive housing, that it is. But certainly, um, there is a huge racial inequity um, and inequality in terms of black, non-Hispanic people experiencing homelessness in the first place. So I think we need to all um, uh, acknowledge that sort of horrible um, reality of our city. Um, and I think we'll talk more about that in some of the, the other slides that we get to uh, a little bit later. Um, we see something a little bit different for people who identify as Hispanic and white non-Hispanic. So compared to the New York City shelter population, people who identify as Hispanic are underrepresented in our supportive housing. 32% of the shelter population compared to 28% of our housing. Um, while in the white non-Hispanic uh, Tenants represent seven, uh, or people represent 7% of the shelter population. They represent about 14% of our supportive housing uh, population. These aren't perfect numbers. They're not apples to apples. Some of the data include children, and some are only adults. The years are a little bit different. So, so it's not um, perfect. Um, but we do um, keep a very close eye on this. We want to um, look at uh, this by individual program as well to see if there's different trends by program type or location or provider. Certainly if we do see um, programs that diverge from the overall trend, that would be something we'd flag in our contract oversight and talk about with you all. Um, so key performance indicators. So for those of you who have DOHMH contracts, I hope these look familiar. Um, they are KPIs that we introduced within the last year or two to highlight um, some of the very important things to pay attention to. Of course, every person is unique, right? Um, I, I understand that there's so much more to all of our lives than these three things, um, but these measures do help us to provide our contracted providers with a picture of where their program stands in relation to similar programs um, that started at the same time, um, that have similar size. Um, they give us a sense of where things are going well and where we need to pay some extra attention. So we look at connection to primary care physician. Obviously, being connected to a health care provider can lead to getting more preventive care services and ultimately um, a healthier life. Um, not perfect, but important. Um, rent arrears ensure residents develop budgeting and money management skills and understanding uh, financial responsibilities. Finally, discharge reason and length of stay looks at um, the strength of a program to support the permanency of their tenants and, and, and uh, their overall life trajectory. So diving into those KPIs, the first one. Um, overall, most tenants report having a primary care physician. Um, this is pretty incredible. There's some variation between race and ethnicity, but overall, I, we're really impressed by these numbers. Uh, Asian Pacific Islanders have the largest proportion of individuals with a PCP, 84%, compared to black tenants who have the lowest proportion, 76%. That's the kind of disparity we want to focus on in our oversight and end, right? Um, these um, connections to health care ultimately translate into to, um, healthier lives and, and longer lives. 
We see that individuals in scattered site housing are more likely to have a primary care physician than those in congregate housing. This does not mean that residents of scattered site programs achieve better physical health outcomes than residents of congregate programs, like length of stay, which cut the other way. There might be other differences that account for this, but it's the kind of thing we're going to look into and keep an eye on. Rental arrears, our second KPI. So I'm a social worker. I don't love talking about rental collection, full disclosure. Uh, But the residence portion of the rent is is the required component of the supportive housing model. So I'm I'm actually pleased to say that the vast majority of supportive housing residents are paying their rent. It's not easy in this city with skyrocketing cost of living. Uh Right? So let's focus on the positive. (laughs) See? This is a good one. It's only going to get more complicated. Um, So we know rental arrears are a real problem. I can feel it. Um, Perhaps most notably, there's been an increase, right? You don't see that on these slides, um, but we we looked at it um, separately, a little bit of a trend over time. In uh, 19, oh, I'm old. Um, In 2021, I'm sorry, in 2020, 22% of our residents were in rental arrears. In 2021, it went up to 24%, and and the following year, it was was 26%. So um, it's ticking up, which is consistent with the sort of overall trends, right, related to the pandemic, um, moratoriums on evictions, a lot of things happening, cost of living increases, income inequality. uh, There's a lot of drivers. Um, But uh, I think, importantly, rental arrears very, very rarely result in eviction in our supportive housing. So I want to make that point as well. We focus on this. We think it's an important part of of one's sort of um, living independently, um, but ultimately it very rarely proceeds to eviction. And so in the next slide, we'll look about reasons that uh, people are leaving our supportive housing. Um, These are all of the discharges um, over a six-year period. Um, Most common reasons for being discharged uh, are death of the residents. Um, A higher uh, proportion of white residents were discharged because of death than any other race or ethnicity. We're just beginning a formal study of this, right, comparison with death records, um, so that we can understand uh, the extent to which these deaths might be preventable or premature. I'm sure many of them are, uh, but not all. Residents may die of natural causes, and that's okay, right? Um, So we're not judging programs um, based on um, the frequency of deaths that occur in them, for example. These are broad indicators that point uh, to um, areas of strength and things that require further attention or analysis, and sometimes further action. The next most common reasons for discharge um, is a move to independent housing. That's great. Uh, or moving in with family and friends. Also, these are positive outcomes. We see a larger proportion of Asian or Pacific Islanders moving into independent housing. Um, The remaining reasons um, towards the right end of these bars uh, are varied. Some of them were positive, some of them negative, some of them neutral. This final slide looks looks at the reason for discharge um, comparing uh, scattered site and congregate. Um, congregate, uh, uh, they're similar, uh, congregate and scattered uh, in terms of people leaving to uh, move into more independent housing, 21% and 22% respectively. Uh, but congregate settings had a higher proportion of individuals discharged due to death, 39% compared to 26%. This may be due to an older population in congregate housing, we're not sure. Um, but it's definitely something that we are um, looking into further. So, um, Thank you and your staff uh, for allowing us to torture you to enter these data into our system. Um, I hope that the reports that we're sending back out to providers give you a sense of how your programs are doing, and this sort of uh, larger citywide look gives you a sense of the sort of tremendous sort of scope and reach of the work that all of you do each and every day. So thank you. We have a resource guy. A resource guy. Okay. Oh, that's up. Okay. There you go. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I really want to thank the panel. Let's give them one more round of applause. That was really great information. I, I saw many of you feverishly taking notes. We're going to share these slides with Shinny, with Tierra, and, and she'll be able to share it with, the, with, with all the participants who attend. And so um, in case you thought you missed something, we'll, we'll get that out through Shinny to you all so you can have that information in hand. I know um, we live in data day in and day out, but it's sometimes not always 
relate to y'all in, in, in a broader way? I think you, you see your indicators if you're supportive of a housing provider, but looking at it at that global perspective, I think is very, very useful. Um, one of the things I love about this conference um, is the diversity of the folks who attend. And by that, I mean not only the folks who attend in Saints, but right, this is the city gender, but I'm also talking about the, the work that they perform. I, um, I could be sitting next to an equity firm provider, and then I'll be sitting next to a case manager or, or someone who, who sets up the furniture or sells the furniture. This is the great um, convening of all the parts that make supportive housing amazing. Um, so I, I saw some folks when we were presenting, like, mm, what does that mean? Or, or quizzical, like, what's LIHTC? Or, <laughs> or, you know, what does that mean? So I, I just want to get a show of hands. How many of y'all are direct support services provided, providing case management, clinical services? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, great. Okay. That's awesome. Can, I, can you raise your hand if you provide financing, acquisition, property management type services? Okay, well, a good number of that too. Gotcha. Yeah. Applaud for that. <laughs> that that's it's amazing. Um, and then there's a lot of other services that um, get, you know get involved in, in providing supportive housing. Um, we're going to open it up to um, questions. Um, we're going to ask that if you could come up to the mic. There's a live mic right in the middle. I know we had a lot of information that we. Um, provided. Um, so please step up. Um, don't make me come down there and put the mic in your faces because I have no qualms in doing so. Um, the young lady, please come up to the mic. Hi. So I was thinking about Jamie's slides, some of the earlier slides where congregate is moving faster. Um, mm -hmm. And I represent, I'm, you know, an officer for um, a supportive housing provider. So I wanted to just ask about reallocation. Um, Craig mentioned that government's going to be looking at that disparity. Um, I'm thinking also that in our organization, we do both mental health shelter, we do supportive housing, we do outreach services. We can see the aging street homeless and also homeless population. Congregate housing, because we build from the ground up, it's ADA compliant. We've got people coming in, they're older, and it is less, I guess, it is more comforting them, for them to be in our site because it is ADA compliant. You have on-site services. So if we see this disparity in the development and in the pipeline, maybe talking about the reallocation from scattered to congregate, there's a whole host of reasons for why it, I think it makes sense, but I would just like to hear more about it. And also to hear, um, I guess, more information from Molly about the, um, how we're going to rapidly increase um, the pipeline in, by two years. So there were a couple of questions in that. So I, I think we're going to start with the aging population and the uh, well. Let's actually start with the redistribution, and then we'll move over to the acceleration. I think. Um, do you want, uh, Craig? Do you want to talk about the redistribution if that's even on the table? <laughs> and I, I know that's a. A loaded question. So I do know that it was a recommendation by the network uh, that um, that government take a look at that. It was a recommendation. Um, there was a lot of uh, a lot of evidence behind that recommendation in terms of from a supportive housing provider perspective that um, that um, there are many challenges to operating scattered site um, programs. Um, we all know that, you know, some of the factors are there are high rents in New York City. Um, also that um, apartments are hard to come by. Quality apartments are hard to come by. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. We understand. Um, and so I think what I can say about what we're doing is that we are reviewing it um, and that this is um, something that's being reviewed at a very high level in terms of in government and um, no decisions have been made as of yet, but the, um, there is very good evidence you know, just from, you know, kind of the market that congregate is where 
uh, supportive housing providers want to they they want to provide that model in the community, and there are many good reasons for that as well. Um, I'm going to leave it there because um, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Uh, <laughs> But just just so you know that we are reviewing that in a very serious way. I, can I just add yeah. one thing? And um, you know, I, I I usually get in more trouble than Craig does, <laughs> but I I do want to add that 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 discussion is not just DSS HRA. We work with HPD, mm-hmm. we work with DOHMH and other partners. So that conversation is happening not just within our agencies, That's across it. our agencies, mm-hmm. city hall, state provider. So. I think that's important to point out. I also want to point out that your voices are very heard through Shinny. We, um, Tierra, and our agencies meet on the regular. Just on the DSS side, we have quarterly uh, HRA meetings. We have quarterly HASA meetings. And then we have quarterly Shinny meetings with providers meetings. We're we're Shinning all the time. (laughs) Um, But I think, I I don't know if you all know that on the, I mean, I know you all work with Shinny regularly, but please note that that communication is frequently relayed to us and we value it because Shinny is the voice uh, and the eyes and the ears and the voice that reports back to us what you are reporting to them. So I, I do want to really, in front, of, in front of Tierra and Pascal, uh, to, to let them know that that's happening. Um, so when you're when, when I hear all these claps and, the, oh, those those comments, please note that we've heard it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Tierra in her role often relays that to us. So um, I'm in those meetings and others who are not in this room are in this meeting. And it's really important that we have that voice. So I just want to acknowledge that to let you all know that that is coming to us. We, we don't sit in silos. We, each of our agencies are having those conversations, so I want to thank Tierra and Shinny for that, but just to let you all know that those conversations happen and we're getting that constant feedback on on on, on the boots on the ground, what's happening. And then I'll turn it over to Emily. I know she had yeah. the other question. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the 1515 initiative and supportive housing in general in New York City really, truly is an interagency partnership, mm-hmm. and we all do talk regularly Shinny is a great voice for all of you. And um, when we do talk with them very regularly, we talk with you, many of you very regularly, and we do, we are really hearing what you are saying. Um, I want to just clarify one acronym that I gave oh, previously. <laughs> LITEC stands for Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Um, sorry for, for giving the acronym. That is a one of that is one of the very uh, one very critical source that we use mm-hmm. to develop affordable housing, um, and it is something that it, it it comes from the federal level. New York State and New York City get a certain allocation every year, um, and we have to disperse that um, strategically as best we can. Um, you know, in thinking about the congregate versus scattered site. Um, challenge we have right now and in thinking about how on top of that we're also supposed to be accelerating our our 1515 production um and then when you layer on the the uh capital resource constraints that hpd has um it's really quite a challenging puzzle to figure out Mm -hmm. um but we are very actively trying to figure it out Mm -hmm. um you know, when we think about whether we could shift from shift some units from scattered site to congregate, if we do that, that means not only are we shifting the service and rental assistance dollars, but it also means that HPD needs capital resources to build those extra congregate units. Um, so, you know, where do we do that? Where does that money come from? Um, so, you know, that's something we're actively thinking about. I mentioned earlier we are starting. You know, for the past many years. Pretty much the only way we were financing new construction housing at HPD was either with 9% tax credits and capital subsidy and a private loan from a bank or with 4% tax credits, volume cap, uh, and capital subsidy. Um, And there just isn't enough of that to go around to keep our overall pipeline at where it needs to be, and particularly as we're thinking about accelerating supportive housing production, really focusing on that. So we are... Um, we are starting to finance more deals without LIHTC or volume cap at all. That means we are putting in a lot more capital into those deals. And so we do have to be very strategic which, with which deals we select 
to do that because our capital budget is what it is. Um, outside of supportive housing, we are looking to bring in other tools to help us finance deals. So um, if anyone was at the panel with the commissioners earlier this morning, you may have heard talk about uh, DSS's master lease program. That is a tool that we're starting to partner with DSS on to leverage um, operating dollars um, to help develop other types of housing that are not supportive housing. And then that theoretically frees up resources that we can devote to support to supportive housing in 1515 production. Um, we are also, um, our HPD every year issues a something called a qualified act, uh, allocation plan or QAP that, um, <laughs> funny, yes, sounds funny when you're, you're not used to hearing it, that <laughs> um, provides the guidelines for how we award our low income housing tax credits or LIHTC. Um, and so for the first time this year, we updated our QAP and our, had a, we added competitive points for projects that include 1515 awards. Um, so that's one way that we're showing we're prioritizing our resources for supportive housing, um, but continuing to look for, for other opportunities. And I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit more on that, because uh, I know we're sort of talking about like moving forward, but just to, to recap what I presented in the slides in terms of the people who are already in our scattered site uh, supportive housing and how they're doing compared to people who are in congregate housing, because that's a common question. Um, uh, and uh, we see some differences, but no real clear you know, um, uh, preference or better option in terms of outcomes, right? So people are staying a little bit longer in congregate compared to scattered. They're um, a little bit less likely to be in rental arrears in congregate than scattered, but they're much more likely to be connected to a primary care in scattered compared to congregate. And the, the percent of, of tenants who are being discharged from uh, congregate versus scattered, there's a lot more death in congregate than scattered. Again, these are associations, relationships. There's no causation here. But just in terms of we, we know there's a lot of challenges with scattered. But the, the delivery, the quality of care that's being given and the, and the outcomes that we're seeing for the people who are already in those units, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a little bit mixed between the two um, uh, model type. So I just wanted to bring that perspective. Uh, I, 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 I just had a quick thought that you know, to the extent that we do have scatter site providers in the room, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want you guys to feel yeah. like, you know, that, that something is imminent, it's going to change with your contracts and mm -hmm. whatnot in our relationships with you guys. It's not. This is something that we're de definitely thinking about, mm -hmm. as, and, and, it's, and we're having high level conversations about that. But definitely, to the extent that any movement is done, it's going to be done deliberately and with, with thought and with, and with being mindful of the contracts that we do currently have. I know HASA has several scatter site contracts and good relationship with our providers. So, you know, and so I don't want anybody to worry that, you know, mm -hmm. come Monday morning, you're going to get a call and say, guess Absolutely. what? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know? Just to piggyback on that, is, and from a model perspective, there, there should be still scattered site model, you know, that it, it fulfills a role mm -hmm. in, in our community. And I do think that, like, you know, um, we're just talking about, like, you know, in the immediate with 1515 in particular right now is showing kind of a market, mm -hmm. you know, issue with scattered site. Uh, and so it, this is not to be down on scattered site as a model because scattered site uh, programs are um, amazing programs in the community, um, and you know they are very fast to implement. Uh, as a reminder, where congregate may take longer to develop, um, we know that. Um, but right now, we're we're listening to what the trend is, and so I just want to kind of put that out there. And uh, you know, just to reiterate Ms. Dudley's point and and what Craig was talking about. Um, the conversations about redistribution would be of units that are not online, mm -hmm. just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there was a gentleman in a blue shirt who had a question. Good afternoon, Rashid Ford. So I've been in support of housing probably about 10 years now, HASA contracts, DOHMH, uh, so on and so forth. My concern is, and my question to you all, as as we're looking more at coordinated uh, uh, entry, as we're looking at this consolidation and practices, and I think about KPI, I think about regs for supportive housing providers, 
how do how are you all going to start i guess to think about how we're balancing client agency and self determination with those KPIs and what you expect of providers and for instance rental arrears um staff safety and so cuz from what I see is sometimes CBOs feel powerless as far as what the recourse is and what the remedy is. And so contracts are 30 pages with what you expect. This is not aggressive, right? With what, no, 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 I'm just being straight. It's, it's long with what the expectations are, but very minimal. Are there examples or is there obvious recourse for what we should do to help our tenants uh, meet some of these key performance indicators because it's certainly not for lack of trying. At times, like just using rental arrears, if there's no consequence, as you pointed out, we don't evict. You know, that's just not what we do, right? We don't make the homeless homeless again. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if we have to do a level one, hasta level two, level four. <laughs> I just wonder if we'll get to a place where city government will start to think about what consolidated efforts can we make and can you all prescribe that will be supported. I think that would help improve the outcomes that are lacking. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started and then I'm going to kick it off to my colleagues. So I, I think for uh, key performance indicators, I, I I want to say that it, it is an indicator, and I think we want to measure the success of the program, and I think that's the, the main goal. So, for example, ju- that was a great example for, for the HIV AIDS Services Administration, Rahas, and, and Ms. Studley can expand on that. You know, we, man- we monitor connection to primary care because at one time, you know, in the early years, if – for many of those of you who are, who are younger, you may not have known, but a lot of supportive housing really was born in the HIV community. Um, it, it was born in the, in the 80s, um, the first um, supportive housing um, HIV um, congregate facility was Billy Hotel, on Christopher Street, right by the piers, um, which I believe it may still exist, and it does still exist today. So um, we want to ensure the folks, to your point, is that they're getting connected to care, that they're safety. Uh, you know, lots of things happen on the back end that, that y'all may not see. So, for example, uh, on DOHMH, um, with Jamie and her colleagues, we, we look at HIV surveillance data. And we say, okay, you know, for everyone who's in supportive housing, actually not just anyone in supportive housing, everyone in HASA, how are those people being connected to care? Um, are, you know, what's their viral load suppression numbers like? Um, have they? What are their CD4 counts, and um, are they CDC diagnosed AIDS versus non-CDC diagnosed AIDS, just HIV only? And and that just gives us a better perspective of where we can enhance our services, how we can ensure that we're targeting the services correctly. You know, obviously for HIV, a lot of the things change. Um, we we try to do that also with emergency room data. Um, again, nothing is perfect in the data that we collect. It's it, it's very messy. But I, I think the intent is always to be able to um, identify what are their strengths, highlight those strengths, because we need to, as we're growing our portfolio, we need to show that it's successful. We know, we, this room, everybody in this, those thousand plus people who are in this conference knows it's successful. But going out there and saying, hey, we need 25, 30, 35,000 per head for a person, we need to show the, 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 we, we, well, we need to show the proof to the folks. You know, why are you going to invest? Why are we moving this type of money? Why are we accelerating programs by two years? To dem- you know, to, we need to demonstrate the success of the program. So a lot of what we're collecting is to demonstrate that it's successful. And then also we have to identify what's not working or what can be tweaked and enhanced. So I think sometimes the, the KPIs the, uh, are, may be misinterpreted, but I, I, I think... Uh, the, the ultimate goal is really to identify the strengths and the challenges in areas for improvement. But I'll turn it over to this team who does the data. I know Jamie and, and, and Ms. Dudley do the day-to-day on that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, our, the KPIs that I presented, you know, conspicuously lacked, you know, target numbers because I think that's impossible for us to sort of arbitrarily just draw a line right here and say that um, our contractors have to achieve, you know, this number by this date. Um, They're loose measures that I think are helpful if they give us 
the um, the data to argue to um, the budget people to say this is the the impact, the value of our services. This is what where we need more, um, you know, resources to do the work, and also to help us with accountability. Right where where there are bad actors or problems emerging, we can see you know blips and things. They're not sensitive measures. They're blunt instruments of, of sort of broad impact or, or areas uh, of a need of extra support. Um, rental arrears is a great one. Um, not great. It's horrible. It's, it's complicated. Right? But you start to unpack that, right? And you say like, well, you know, there's, there's in the general population, there's always going to be a portion of people that are, you know, not paying their rent, right? And how does it compare to that? Um, are there different providers or locations where there's trends emerging? Is it because of the cost of, you know, uh, the rent in a particular neighborhood? Or is it because a provider has a different approach um, that may be good or bad? to collecting rent, right? There may be, you know, great, you know, budgeting skills, or there may be a really paternalistic approach to sort of managing tenants' um, income, right? So it can go both ways. They just, they point us to places just where we start to sort of dig in. Um, but they're not, um, they're by no means um, uh, perfect or sensitive measures of, of like success or, you know, go- all good or all bad. Mm-hmm. That's, my, that's my take on it. And um, from the HASA perspective, I can speak to that because often um, when there are requests to go to housing court or um, things of that nature or if they're the step one, two, three conferences, um, at some point either myself or Pam Farquhar, who's the Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Housing, she, you know, one of us is looped into that process. And um, as been indicated earlier by, by Jamie, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's challenging um, there's no one prescription that's going to work for all clients. Um, for myself, I, I try to treat each client individually. And, and, and when I'm asked about um, when the clients in the case conference process, I want to see from that individual client what's been attempted. Which, given in mind, it's not going to always be successful. But just documented attempts to provide services to that client and to link that client with care, um, it may be attempts to work out a payment plan. It may be attempting to link that client to um, a referral to mobile crisis. It may be linking that client to other community-based organizations who can who can assist um, with providing care, knowing that the resources may not always be there to provide what's needed within the program. But those are the things that I'm looking for on an individual basis, and I don't have a pre- specific prescription of, of what will work each time, as, as, as nobody un, in, in this room would have. Mm-hmm. But I, I personally look at each client individual, individually and look at what's been attempted mm-hmm. and um, what's been tried before and what's been successful and not successful. And again, as we talked about, you know, simply because a client is not paying their share of the rent to me, that might not necessarily mean the client should be taken to housing court. But each case has to be in, um, evaluated individually. We get, we get into this knowing that we're dealing with, we're working with clients who have a, a myriad of challenges. And that's why, that's why they're in support of housing. So each client has to be really um, evaluated on his or her own merits and what has worked, what has not worked, and what has been tried and what's documented that's been tried and if it hasn't been successful, that we could talk about what other things are um, we can bring to bear to try to assist this client. But it, it, but I don't have an answer to say. Mm-hmm. And, and if A, B, and C happens, then fine. Um, um, we, we can move to housing court or whatever. Because, you know, and quite frankly, with everything that's been going on lately, we're going to be, we're going to be seeing less and less of that. Because um, supportive housing providers are under a microscope right now. As far as um, um, moving to housing court, so we're going to really put more and more scrutiny on that, and really hold you guys more and more to do, uh, to, feet to the fire as far as okay, have we really tried everything, including perhaps relocating the client to another facility that might be in your portfolio or with another provider? Have we really tried everything? Because it's, it's tough. We don't have any answers, but we're really, really going to be going through a fine tooth comb right at, right now before we really. Um, um, Give it okay to move forward, but um, and, um, but again, one of the things I always remind providers about is a mobile crisis, um, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know if you guys have um the number for that. It's New York's one eight hundred New York City Well. I think it's one eight 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 New York City Well. I believe, and you can make it for for clients who are um, exhibiting behavioral problems. 
That's a resource that I don't think enough providers are taking advantage of. And they do um, provide assistance to supportive housing um, programs. So they, they do. Now, they're not always successful. Nothing's always successful. Mm-hmm. But they will take um, um, referrals from supportive housing providers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, piggyback on what everyone is saying is that, um, you know, HRA is um, – leading a rent arrears task force right now. So this is really being looked at. Um, This is a very complicated issue. Um, One of the things that came up um, on the panel with the city commissioners, um, our DSS commissioner, Molly Park, wanted to make it clear to everyone that you don't have to take somebody to court in order to get a one-shot deal with HRA. Mm -hmm. So I would like to also reiterate that here. Um, There have been challenges in the process of the one-shot deal that can be fully acknowledged. We're all going through uh, resource issues. Supportive housing providers are going through resource issues. And so... Um, You know, none of these systems are perfect right now. And as the data bears out, this has become exacerbated, this this rent arrears issue. So where it was maybe simmering before, it's now coming to a head. And so I do think that we're looking for in its early days and what we're looking for in the task force, there's providers, there's tenants, there are, um, you know, uh, the network is at the table. There, mm-hmm. it, it's a good group of people that is really looking at, like, in the near term, what can we do? What are things that we can do immediately to try to, you know, stem, you know, this issue uh, that providers are facing? Because really, it is about, like you're saying, it's about partly about the tenant responsibility, but it's also about our responsibility to then make the provider uh, financially whole as well, right? And so I think that what that's the kind of the approach that this task force is, um, you know, going at this problem. It is recognized as a serious issue, and um, you know, stay tuned because I think that we are going to have some you know, very concrete solutions to, you know, help in the near term and long term. Well, one of the things that HASA is going to be looking into in particular is um, financial management, the ability to bring that to bear on an involuntary or voluntary basis. We have contracts um, with um, community-based organizations to provide um, um, voluntary financial management if the client consents, but also in in a certain extreme cases, um, we may be able to um, enroll some clients in, in financial management on an um, involuntary basis mm-hmm. if, they, if the client unfortunately has um, a mental health diagnosis that, that warrants that, um, um, that action to be taken. So um, as Craig says, um, you definitely don't have to um, <laughs> take a client to housing court in order to apply for a one-shot deal, not, not even at HASA. Um, um, we will consider it for all clients. But one of the things we're going to be looking at to, 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 um, to try to see of going forward, we, we're not only paying the arrears, but addressing the underlying problem as to why the client got to that, era, to that stage is to look to see um, um, how we can utilize, better utilize financial management for clients. And this is for clients who, um, unfortunately, is only for clients who um, have SSI or SSD income. The good news is the majority of our clients who have income, that's what they have. But if a client is employed, they cannot manage the um, employment income or anything like that. But um, those are just some other, a couple of other options that we're going to look into more deeply um, to uh, help address circumstances where clients are just reluctant um, uh, to pay their share of the rent. I'm going to take a moment to switch gears. Um, I, I go out a lot to providers, and I, I often get asked, um, by providers, but also when I go to shelters and and other emergency housing facilities, why is it so challenging for me to get into a supportive housing program? Mm-hmm. I often get asked that, and we're trying to look at it through the uh, the tenant perspective, the client perspective. We're we're here mostly supportive housing providers, but we also have to look at it that uh, on that angle. And um, 
a large part of that is the required documentation that mm-hmm. is necessary. And there's an array of reasons why we have we need so many documents. But I know uh, this team and many people who are not at this table who are really integral at, on on the thinking of that are are meeting to try to say, hey, how how can we lessen the burden? So I, I want to speak to this panel. I want to ask them, what are we trying to do to lessen the burden on the on the documentation front for folks who are trying to get into supportive housing? We recognize that most, well, m- most if not all of them are homeless, and and many of them are are being qualified due to. Um, mental illness, um, substance use, active substance use, or physical disabilities. So what are some efforts that we're doing to to try to lessen the documentation burden for folks trying to enter into the system? Um, well, one of the things that we're looking at is that um, what we've noticed is that um, even when somebody, um, an individual or family, is eligible and referred, there's a whole other, you know, application system that people have to go through in order to go into supportive housing, and um, and then that that burden of collecting the documents for the clients. Uh, we, you know, under OSAS, we have a whole unit that is dedicated, a whole team that to um, what we call follow up, and so. You know, not only do they need the social security card, the photo ID, you know, like all the standard. What we we do sometimes get requests for documents that are not required, and so um, uh, I'll I will kick it to Emily at 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 some point. But like <laughs> HPD has done a lot of work with kind of educating everyone around like what are the what are just the most you know, the, the ones that are actually required for, say, the LIHTC, right? And um, those kind of um, document requirements, because we do sometimes see, it's, it's rather unfortunate, but there are sometimes people who have gone through everything, they've, they've been, they're eligible, they've been referred, they have gone through the apartment viewing at the supportive housing provider, they're what we consider linked, you know, like they're 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 in that apartment as far as we're concerned, but then there is sometimes fall off at that point, and that has been a lot of effort that we've been, you know, making to try to you know streamline that so that um, we can have a successful placement of the uh, of the individual or family. Did you want to say anything more? Emily? Yeah. So you know, I, I work in development at HPD, so the the rent up side of things is not. Oh, my, sorry. Quite my <laughs> wheelhouse, but I can speak yeah, a little bit yeah. to it. You know, we because of the different financing tools we use to build a building, there are um, requirements associated with that. So, low income housing tax credits. There's income. You need to income certify. Sometimes we use federal home dollars. Sometimes we use Section Eight, and they all have their own requirements for documenting incomes and certifying on an annual basis. So we have really been putting a lot of effort into um, making sure our partners um, understand that they really only should be requesting the absolute bare minimum that is needed to meet those requirements and where you know one document can serve multiple purposes, they should be doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, just really making sure that the barrier to entry um, that is as low as possible mm-hmm. from a documentation standpoint. I'll also say that, you know, as we're starting to f- look at funding some deals without low-income housing tax credits, and we're doing that for supportive housing, that's an added benefit is removing all of those income documentation requirements. And uh, I would add that the Adams administration is also, you know, um, in discussions with our federal partners, in discussion with HUD, and also even the IRS around some of these requirements. So there are policy discussions being had by the Adams administration to try to um, uh, make it um, more you know, friendly for the individuals. These are low-income individuals, and, but they have to prove their income and you know, like there, it, the, it's very onerous that that, that documentation requirement. And we don't want to lose the people because of that, right? 
And so um, there are discussions being had. And I think actually some progress, there are like some glimmers of light, you know, in, 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 in those discussions to see, to move the needle so that it, they can say, take, you know, like say uh, a budget letter or something like that and don't need to, you know, have everything documented the way, um, the way that those, these requirements are structured. So hopefully we'll see some progress on that in the near future. Then I'm going to, one last question. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, I want to ask about low barrier admissions. I, I think that's screening folks in and making that ver as low threshold as possible is incredibly important to get folks into the door. Getting the paperwork, then, is the second step. But actually getting the folks into the door is incredibly important and, and reducing those barriers. What efforts are being made to reduce, you know, the barriers and ensure that the screening for, of, of potential tenants is as low barrier as possible to ensure that the folks can get accepted without jumping through so many hoops? I you, can, Jane. I can take it. Sure. Um, so, I th so last spring, I think it was last spring, a year ago-ish, um, uh, the health department released um, some guidance um, shifting from this idea of a, of a clinical interview that it was a term that was often used um, to an apartment viewing um, in recognition that a, a person's eligibility, at least for um, um, situations where, where a person is qualifying because of their mental illness or their substance use history, uh, plus their homelessness, right? Um, that, that clinical eligibility is determined, uh, you know, by HRA and their um, application process. And so um, we felt strongly that there, the, the tenant, the prospective tenant sort of tour, visit, um, of the building and meeting with the provider was uh, not intended um, to be a clinical assessment because um, that was already done. It was a, an opportunity for, for each to um, communicate information, right, the provider to communicate information to the prospective tenant, the tenant to look at the potential apartment, um, and then to talk about sort of move in. Um, any assessment that would be done there really should inform the sort of ongoing individualized service planning once the person's in the apartment. Um, I feel strongly that like everything is better when you're housed, right? Like um, you can certainly take steps towards your um, physical and emotional well-being while unhoused, um, but um, it's going to be a lot better, a lot easier, a lot firmer foundation if you can do that from your own home. Um, and so we really want to move away from this idea that a person's not housing ready or they need different levels of care, and sometimes there are, you know, some variations in levels of care, um, but everything's better when you're housed. Um, and so those assessments and the work that the providers are going to do, we want to help that wrap around the person, right, for um, uh, supports that can be offered from within the housing program, connections beyond the housing program that can also um, promote um, uh, um, recovery, right? And so we are talking about how to make it easier for supportive housing providers to access a wider array of mental health and substance use services. It is hard, admittedly, to, to distinguish between all the different acronyms and levels of care that are out there. And so we are owning that and trying to, to build something that will be much more streamlined. Um, but at the end of the day, we really think um, we want to uh, get as many people into housing and then sort of begin um, or simultaneously. All right, there's no perfect, you know, stage uh, steps here. Uh, at the same time, sort of bring in the, the um, uh, care individualized service plan that will um, be right um, uh, for that person in that moment in time. All right. I think we have a question right over you. I wanted to check in on some of the other goals of the Get Stuff Built, um, which is uh, on the development side. Uh, Laurie from Brownsville Partnership. Uh, just uh, progress or what's coming down the pipe for the other types of coordination that we all know is needed to um, get our projects uh, built and, uh, um, and remove unnecessary financial burdens, I don't know, restitution fees for dead trees and things um so yeah <laughs> so i'd love to hear a little bit about that that was also i think part of the ambition for the two years of acceleration so any updates would be welcome thanks yeah so i can talk a little bit about what hpd is doing and a little bit about what we're involved in um there's a lot of other agencies involved and 
get stuff built, city of yes, um, all that stuff. Um, you know, so on HPD's end, we are going to be um, pretty shortly going to be releasing updated design guidelines for new construction. Um, we recently released um, updated updated design guidelines for preservation. Um, we're going to be streamlining our design review process um, to make it um, hopefully much quicker and easier to get through HPD's design review process and um, really focused on eliminating duplication that we may have had with reviews that DOB um, are already doing. So that is hopefully coming out um, sometime this summer. We're working very closely with the Department of City Planning um, to prepare for um, uh, rezoning um, that will um, hopefully, if it passes, um, increase um, uh, FAR, which is floor area ratio, um, basically allow sites to uh, build more housing if that housing is affordable housing. So getting more out of the sites that we have in the city so we can build more. Um, so that is something that is going to be coming down the pike. A citywide rezoning um, involves every single community board and every single council member and every single borough president. Um, so we would very much appreciate your support once that is certified and you know going to your local community board and um, helping us get, get it passed because um, mm -hmm. it will be very transformative um, and provide us with a lot more tools to build to build more. Um, there are other things around just reducing duplication and administrative burden to, to get things done quicker. Um, but those are just a few of the highlights. I have one last question. You. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if you're behind me. Um, questions for HRA. I was looking at this slide, looking at ages of folks that are in supportive housing, and there's many reasons for right, I'm sure, but in looking at the very low number of young adults under 25 years old who are in supportive housing and some of the systemic barriers that might be a, one of the causes of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I know historically the Office of Affordable and Supportive Housing has considered anyone who's not in a DHS shelter showing up in CARES as um, being categorically not available to be referred to a housing interview, which is obviously going to disproportionately impact um, folks who are accessing other city-funded homeless services such as DYCD, um, runaway and homeless youth services, or domestic violence shelters. So I was looking at the low rate, and I know that my clients have historically had a problem getting access to interviews for that reason, because they're not in DHS shelter. Is um, that going to be changing? Will everyone be treated kind of equally in getting access to interviews? Um, and just to be clear, I'm not specifically talking about young adult supportive housing buildings. Um, I primarily work with young adults who are also chronically homeless with serious mental illness, and they have much better long-term housing outcomes in general adult programs. So I want to make sure they have equal access to the programs where their needs will be best met. Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. Can you, can you repeat the question? I think folks in the back didn't hear. I, oh. Well, I, I think that the question is that um, this is a procedural question, really. Is like, it, is HRA reviewing like um, what you're saying? Is that we're only um, referring people who are in the shelter who are young adults, right? Is that what is? Can, can you clarify yes. that? Sure. So I'm saying if somebody has a um, supportive housing application submitted mm -hmm. and says that they are eligible for housing for folks who are chronically homeless with serious mental illness, that might be a POP A, that might be a New York City 1515 chronically mm -hmm. homeless single adult, um, that I know historically um, the Office of Affordable and Supportive Housing looks at is that person with that approval in a DHS shelter last mm -hmm. night, mm -hmm. and if they're not, then they're not going to be referred to an interview, even if they meet all the exact same eligibility criteria. Mm -hmm. And that will obviously have a disproportionate impact on people who are not who are using city-funded homeless services that just happen to not be DHS services. So, so um, I, I would politely challenge the um, the what you're saying in terms of like how we refer people okay. at the Office of Supportive and Affordable Housing, but I think that um, you know because we do uh, referrals for more than just the DHS shelter system. I will also say that we do predominantly refer from the, the DHS shelter system, so it's both. Um, it's not either or. 
Um, so, but I am interested in hearing more about what you're saying so that if there is room for improvement, that we could um, take a look at that issue, okay? Because we do take seriously the young adult population and um, that, is, that, that population has, you know, uh, you know, special challenges in terms of, you know, referral and placement, and um, maybe we can work together on that. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. I, I want to be mindful. I know there's another panel study now. Can we please give a round of applause for our amazing panel? <laughs> And, and many thanks to, to all of you for participating and the amazing questions. Have a great remainder of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you.